opportunities are based off of three things timing, luck, and being prepared. How to be an overcomer, resiliency, making connections, practicing, and then finally taking advantage of the resources that are available to you. Most pilots don't understand what career opportunities are available in the world of aviation. They're making career decisions based on advice from friends or posts on internet forums. Meaning they're taking huge risks with their livelihood without having all the details. This podcast was created to help you understand the aviation industry so you can find your dream job. Let's get ready for pushback. Here's your host and my dad, Nick Fialka. Hey, pilot. Welcome back to another interview episode of Ready for Pushback. I'm Nick Fialka. I'm your host today, and I am stoked that you are here I have a reoccurring guest that shows up every now and then, and that person is Jimmy. Jimmy is our anonymous friend, and here is what is cool about Jimmy showing up. Jimmy is a person, a pilot, who has had an experience and who wants to get some coaching and uh, talk about what happened in their predicament, and they're looking for a way to get some clarity. However... They don't want to share their name with the world, and they're also very gracious to let themselves be recorded on the show, and I'm very thankful for that. It's been a great time having the different Jimmy participants show up, and I think that it's really valuable. A lot of people write in about how much they appreciate that, so to Jimmy, thank you so much for being on this show, and if you are a person who would like to talk about something and get some coaching, whether or not you want to remain anonymous, just reach out. I'm happy to chat. Love to have you as a guest. And it's really valuable for the listener, for the pilot that's tuning in as well. So this is a great one. I think you're really going to enjoy it. And so sit back, relax. Let's get ready for pushback. Hey, pilot, did you just get a new conditional job offer? Are you getting out of the military and going to move your family across the country? Are you going to move in base somewhere or are you going to go out to find that second home that you've been looking for? Well, I want you to stop right now, pick up the phone and call Marty and the team at Trident Home Loans. It's an organization that's run by pilots. They understand pilot pay. They understand contracts. They understand military. They have the best VA loans in the United States. Marty and his team have been doing mortgages for years. They've been doing my mortgages for years. I trust him and his team more than any other organization. I challenge you to get a better deal anywhere else. Go ahead, reach out, get a mortgage quote, and then call Marty and his team. They will walk you through the process and show you how competitive their rates are. So go right now, tridenthomeloans.com and check them out. All right, Pilot, we have another super special guest and we're going to be talking with my friend, Jimmy. Jimmy, good day. How are you, man? I'm doing well. And it, gosh, it's a pleasure to speak with you, Nick. And I got to say, it's an honor too. I follow you on LinkedIn and you start off with saying, Sir Nick Fialka. So hopefully we can get into that a little bit today. <laughs> Oh man, that's funny. Yeah, that's a little corner of my life. Dude, I am so glad you're here. We are going to talk. You reached out and you asked to have this conversation. And I think that this is going to be so interesting because there are so many people that fit into where you are. And so can you lay out just a little bit about your background and set the stage for the pilot that's listening? Absolutely, Nick. So when you think of me, you got to come back to where are my roots from. And I'm ultimately uh, an Eagle Scout that grew up in Buffalo, New York. All right. So keep that in mind. When you think of Buffalo, you think of, you know, hey, there's a lot of cold winters. Of course, my Buffalo Bills, we went to four Super Bowls and uh, we didn't necessarily win them, but hey, we made them and we're resilient people. Uh, so yet again, always kind of come back to that, you know, scenario. I'm talking to you now as a professional pilot with 20 years of military and civil aviation experience. You know, my goal really where I'm at right now is just about under a year transitioning from the military and actually doing a military retirement. So all in all, I actually enlisted in the Air Force 26 years ago. So with that being said, I'm looking forward to sharing my story of how I transited and, and kind of navigated my way through this whole 
cockpit to cockpit transition. And ultimately, it's trying to make that best match so I can be with the place where I wanted to be able to showcase my professionalism, my proficiency, and positive attitude. That's awesome, man. And so you started out not as an Air Force pilot. So what is your background? Right. So my Air Force pilot background actually kind of starts off with, I enlisted in the Air Force. So picture it, like I said, Buffalo, New York, right? I actually applied for the Air Force Academy when I was in high school. Our high school was actually right by the Buffalo Niagara International Airport. I'd ride my bike to and from school. So got to see a lot of aircraft that were on arrival and departure, all those cool things like, hey, maybe someday, right? Well, I actually enlisted in the Air Force because what I ended up doing was I started off by filling out a postcard for going to the Air Force Academy. And what ends up happening is I would get a monthly newsletter. And I thought I was like, oh man, I'm well on my way. And what ends up happening is after a couple of months of getting that newsletter, I was asked to distribute and actually relay my standardized test scores. So I did relay those scores that I had. And I stopped receiving the newsletter after that. It's okay because it was some good feedback from that point. And like I said, between that junior to senior year of high school, best decision in my life, I did the late enlistment program to join the Air Force and it's been awesome. So after that, I graduate high school, I go into uh, basic training and I'm in tech school. And what ends up happening next is I'm just learning to be an aircraft maintainer. There was a great opportunity that presented itself on a, like a Saturday morning when I was in training where they were looking for airmen interested in applying to the Air Force Academy. I went ahead and I went there and I was the only one in the audience. So it's where I like to say in this part of this journey that it's uh, opportunities are based off of three things timing, luck, and being prepared. So I took that opportunity, learned from it, and ran with it. Ultimately, I filled out my uh, application as an airman, and I got accepted to what's known as the uh, Air Force Academy Prep School. So the 10-month program from there is uh, complete, and then four years to follow, I go ahead and get commissioned as an officer. Once you were commissioned as an officer, where'd you go after that? Sure. So I was able to go on to pilot training. I started off staying at the Air Force Academy, lovely Colorado Springs, flying the Diamond DA-20. It was fun. We did what was called initial flight training back then, and I was able to earn my private pilot's license. Fast forwarding, I did go on to uh, pilot training uh, down in Texas and flew the T-6, the T-1, really had a great time. Ultimately, I was uh, selected to fly the mighty KC-135 Stratotanker out of North Dakota. And that was one of the, yet again, uh, an opportunity that I ran with. So for the next four, four and a half years, I went ahead and I did a ton of flying, whether it was at home station, but mainly when there was some deployed flying over supporting Operation Iraqi Freedom and Operation Enduring Freedom. So over those four and a half years, I accumulated a boatload of total hours, PIC time and all. In 2009 is what happens, another interesting point in my life when the Air Force is looking to bolster up a new mission. And I get selected to do this thing called unmanned aircraft flying. So for the next uh, you know, nine years, I go ahead and I fly the MQ-1. And then for the past four, I've been doing the MQ-9. Awesome. So that's Predators and Reapers, I think, are the two, right? Absolutely. Yes. I'm so glad that I know that. And I guess I should apologize because I said earlier, like, hey, not an Air Force pilot. You are an Air Force pilot, but you essentially left the cockpit, even though you are a, an operator of an aircraft, you're not sitting in the sky. So are you getting flight time? Do you qualify as getting flight time doing that? Great question. I had accumulated just about 2,000 hours as an MQ-1 and MQ-9 pilot. All right. And just for, for the audience so that they're aware, it's a total cruise resource uh, major weapon system. So what we have is you'll have a pilot in the left seat. You'll also have a sensor operator who is an enlisted airman in the right seat. And we are accomplishing the mission, which is basically persistent attack and reconnaissance. And I can tell you what, for the ability for us to operate around the world 
It is amazing and a surreal mission because, like I say, what we have that ability to do is through satellite communications, have, like I say, where you're at, Nick, in your own house right here, like you'd be at your local base, we can actually work through the data links to have you control a plane that could be anywhere around the world. All right. How this relates back to what I'm trying to talk about for an unmanned aircraft journey in my pathway, like for the past 10, 11 years, we had this other side mission, which is called launch and recovery element. It basically is the remote takeoff and landing capabilities. We use a a frequency that basically has the ability to have real-time reactions as you're flying the plane inside the ground control station, as we call it, our cockpit. You're able to do the takeoffs and landings pretty much remotely, all right? And it is manual. We are controlling the plane as if you were in the plane, all right? So for the past 11 years, I've been doing that, whether it's the MQ-1, MQ-9, And about two years ago, it was an honor for me to have been selected. We're actually deployed for a year out to an overseas location where we actually did, I was the commander for our squadron, where we did those remote takeoffs and landings. And it was a huge amount of pride taken for our squadron to be able to deliver uh, disciplined aviation as far as that capability is concerned so that we can meet the daily air tasking orders. So if I am trying to build flight time and things like that. Can I log that time? Can I put that in the book? Is there a special category for it? Or is it PIC? Or how does that line up? So I mentioned to you, I had that just near 2,000 hours of MQ1s and MQ9 time. As I was going through this past year of coming up on, I'm doing my research for a cockpit to cockpit transition for the airlines. I actually had to take that time and move it to the side. None of that accounts. So I think yet again, when I was doing a lot of research, one of the interesting things was I came across this group called RTAG. And I listened to episodes. I actually attended the RTAG convention last October. And it was really cool to hear Josh Lee say how he shook 3,500 hands of the attendees. Well, I was one of them. And uh, really enjoyed seeing everybody in all the red shirts. And yes, absolutely everything you've mentioned during that episode, I can attest to it. I was there. It was a great experience. And I think yet again, to make the point is I'm really impressed with how the Rotary to Air Group community has grown and evolved over the years. And I just feel like from my standpoint, as an unmanned air crew aviator, we have a lot of similarities and uh, can we help each other out? I've learned a ton, for example, from the r All right. Yeah, I have to, let me tell you. And don't tell Joshua Lee or PJ, but I happen to have one of those red shirts that I was able to sneak off with. And I wear it sometimes, (laughs) maybe. And I probably owe them $50. This is really interesting. So you have 2,000 hours of time. You've been doing all of this work, all of this effort. And here you are at the end of your career. You're fortunate because you have the KC-135 time. And you're unfortunate because you have this lots and lots of flight time that you can't count. However, you have grown probably leaps and bounds in crew resource management and the ability to interact in a team and show leadership and all of those other aspects. And so it's been a long time since you've been in the cockpit. How did you manage this going from the fact that, hey, I've got this UAS unmanned systems stink on me. Now I want to go back into the sky and do my own thing. How do you make that jump? How do you make that transition? Timothy P. Pope is a certified financial planner dedicated to guiding professional pilots through smart financial planning. Whether it's saving for retirement, investment management, a seamless military transition, or strategic tax planning, Tim is your trusted financial partner. Also, you can join Tim as he leads engaging discussions on personal finance and strategies for professional pilots on the brand new Pilot Money Podcast. Timothy P. Pope helping professional pilots make the most out of life. So glad you asked that. And that's really what I wanted to get across to the audience here today is a formula. I kind of talked to you a little bit about my personal philosophy of opportunities, being that timing, luck, and being prepared. Well, let's move forward to being an overcomer, how to be an overcomer. Because yet again, there's a lot of challenges. I had that unlimited, unrestricted, I'm sorry, ATP minimums achieved for my KC-135 time. But for the past like 10, 11 years, not having that being available to be able to, to translate with my RPA time as well. So how to be an overcomer? Four key things on this one, Nick. Resiliency is key. Two, making connections. Three, 
practicing, 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 and then finally taking advantage of the resources that are available to you. So take it step by step. So resiliency is key. For me, it's my family. Ultimately, like even with the military, a strong proponent as a leader to make sure that you have your physical, your spiritual, your mental resiliency in check. We call it comprehensive airman fitness and it's real. So even to the point, I'm not just kind of sugarcoating it, but as a leader, I dedicate a day each month for us to have that discussion within uh, the team that I lead. So whether it's onsite or offsite events, we make it happen. All right. So you got to be able to kind of roll the punches. As I mentioned to you before, I had that ability for I was trying to get to the Air Force Academy out of high school. Didn't get it. It's okay. You know, even later on as a commissioned officer, I tried to be a presidential advance agent. I made it to the final round of interviews at the Pentagon. I thought I was in. This is awesome, right? Well, I was not one of the ones selected and it's okay. So ultimately, you got to be able to roll with those highs and lows to be able and make it on through. Second, the connections. So what I'm talking about is you need to build that network, right? I've heard so much here on your podcast, Nick. It is so true. So for the past year, whether it was friends, my mentors, taking advantage of, I would say one of the best things is those professional aviation pilot groups, okay? Uh, you had Jessica Ortega on as a guest before, PPOT. Hey, I got to say, I'm a frugal fun guy, all right? So the cheap mushroom in me says, take advantage of all those available free sources that are out there. And uh, PPOT was a membership that I was able to be a part of. I'm in the Las Vegas area, so I I actually found out that the Asian Pilots Association, or PAPA, was having their first expo last year. All I had to do was pay $45 to join. And I was like, I'm there. All right. So best 45 bucks. And to be honest, over the past year, I went from just being a kind of like member, volunteer at the expo forum to gaining huge help on the PAPA side from the standpoint of like my trusted, you know, top mentors come from there. It's a first officer with a regional, also a retired uh, captain from a major. And they don't care necessarily what group you're coming from or where you want to go to. It's it's all about it, that we're in it together. I want to bring this up real quick because the listener probably doesn't know, but you are not of Asian descent, are you? Uh, correct. If you look at my picture, you're going to say, what's this guy doing talking about Professional Asian Pilots Association? I kind of mentioned to you how I've grown over even just this past year of just being a member to like, yet again, earning the trust. But I got to say to not just being a volunteer at the Expo last July, this past January, I was honored to be selected as the Southwest Region Lead for PAPA. And so six states, uh, we work on two major things as far as our social events to encourage the interaction within members and then also educational outreach to the community, especially young aviators. So it's just been an honor. And I got to say, the most welcoming group. I know there's so many good groups that are out there, but for me personally, and this is where you got to find your fit, it was Ben Papa for me. So I really enjoy it and I'm really honored and lucky to be part of their team. All right. So where are we on our steps here? We did step. You got it. Hey, you're tracking. We're halfway there. So the connections are made, right? Now it's time to practice, practice, practice. All right. In my storyline, yet again, I did a ton of research. I actually had applications with, oh gosh, about 12 different airlines because I heard you got to get that wide net, right? And what ends up happening is I go ahead and I'm seeing that like my way forward is trying to go through and utilize a pilot pathway to kind of overcome the recency hurdle, if you will. I actually apply for one. I get accepted from a major's airline for their pathway program to actually interview. And I do that in the last November timeframe. I was honored to be there. thought I rocked everything. And a week later, it just so happens it was the week of Thanksgiving, I get a call. And that call said, hey, Richard, thanks for applying. But on this round, you haven't been selected. And it's okay. So the key thing I got from that was I got some feedback from it. And for that reason, I was able to learn some stuff on how to improve skills, uh, interview skills, and also uh, to 
pretty much get back into some man flying. So fast forward even a, a little bit forward, I attended another pilot job fair, uh, got connected with a part 135 that thought it was another good connection, skill bridge program opportunity. I went ahead and applied for that interview, went really well, but the same result kind of happened. I wasn't selected and I was kind of doubting myself. So kind of going back into that rule number one of being resilient, but I learned and applied that feedback that I received, which was to practice. And it was the key phrase that I applied in that regard was to utilize the LinkedIn kind of like they have a premium edition for interview simulator uh, scenarios. I was able to kind of practice them out and to kind of close this point down is one of the best things that happened to me was to uh, go ahead and actually have my family sit at the kitchen table and kind of act as the interview panel. I went ahead and actually, you know, it was like, you know, when I got an opportunity to re-interview with that majors pilot pathway program again, I was able to go ahead and have my family each and every day. They acted and they kind of like had random questions for me. They even changed their names each time. So we had the ability to really put me on the spot. Okay. So you got to practice. You got to be all into it. The final thing is to take advantage of pilot transition resources. So I told you before that I was uh, deployed overseas for a year. And outside of accomplishing the daily mission, I did have some time. I knew I was coming up on the transition. So I took advantage of watching a lot of podcasts, YouTube episodes, all those uh, you know, kind of resources that are out there, study materials for training courses and such. I encourage anybody that has this drive and has a dream of doing the transition, you got to be all involved into it. I kind of even checked in prep for this uh, interview with you, Nick, that I was like, you know, how many subscriptions do I have on YouTube for podcasts that are aviation related? And I think I'm right around 50 so far. So I know you got to be into it and you got to ultimately learn something new each and every day. Well, I certainly hope this is your favorite podcast. That's uh, golden. Uh, Yes, of course. All right, man, that's so good. So we have resiliency, connection, practice, 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 and then take advantage of the resources that are out there. And so right. here you are, you got denied a couple times. And so how did you recover? Where did you go from there? Right. So when I got the call after not getting accepted for the first opportunity, and then also the call just so happens, I already told you that first one was the week of Thanksgiving. Well, the second time I wasn't accepted was the week of Christmas. I'm like, oh boy, what's going on? Second guessing myself, am I doing this right? Talking to my family, it goes back to that resiliency is key point. Yet again, pretty much it was taking that hard look at like where I'm at, like I said, staying focused of applying the feedback. You're not going to get a CGO out of every interview, Nick. Uh, that's one thing I've learned. And it's okay. You don't have to feel like you're a failure or anything like that. What I want to get across to everybody here is to be an overcomer, ask for the feedback and really understand and take it in. Like I said, in my case, it was to learn and get better at interview skills, also to get back into man flying. I touched a little bit on the interview skills. And like I said, I think the secret sauce was my family at the kitchen table to get me across the finish line. The other piece of the puzzle was getting back into man flying. So thankfully, uh, there's some uh, great flying schools that are around across the country for that matter. But there's some barriers that go through that as well. Time, money key thing. All right. So one of the things that was lucky for me to do was I went to an AOPA Rusty Pilots Program seminar that was at uh, our local airport. And I kind of explained my my situation. Uh, Luckily, there was a raffle and uh, I put in my my five or 10 bucks or whatever the, the raffle of ticket prices were. And I scored a one hour free flight in a Piper Archer. And it was awesome. So I got connected with a, uh, uh, a CFI that is part of the flying club. And we've been rocking it ever since. So I'd say, like I said, kind of be fully immersed in the culture of what you want to become. For me, it was that, you know, two no's. All right, I'm not giving up. I know this is what I want for me. And then I went ahead and yet again, started doing those, what I call my my weekend warrior flying uh, over at the flying club. So showcasing the consistency, not giving up. And I got to say too, it was at this point that I got introduced to a lot of Spitfire resources that were out there. And I got to say, just attending the webinars have been awesome. Uh, I learned something new every time. Uh, I really like how I actually had the opportunity uh, talking with Yaron to really get deep answering my knowing my why 
And I got to say, I used that answer as part of that practice for then when I got interviewed again, I was able to lucky enough to, to get a re-interview with that major airlines pilot pathway program. And it was awesome. That is, so let me bring, let me bring this kind of around real quick. When, for those that have never done any Spitfire training, we do precision interview coaching, which we do multiple times a day, seven days a week. And it's, it's an opportunity for you and a group of your peers to sit down and answer questions with one of our coaches and get direct feedback. And that's good. It's very similar to sitting around the table with your family. But what the difference is, is the fact that first off, they're pilots, right? So that's a good thing. Second off, you get perspective because you're Ron and me are two totally different people. We are dear friends and we are lockstep but we give different feedback and we think about different things when we hear an answer. And so what you, you get this broad brush stroke, brush stroke perspective with like Nikolai or Casey or any of the other amazing coaches that we have, as you chew on an answer and you answer it three or four or five times and you start to create a holistic view of what that answer really and who you really are, I think is a little bit, there's more depth to it than just, your high schooler saying, pop, that wasn't that great. Oh my gosh, you just look so nervous. So it's good. <laughs> right. So use all of the arrows in your quiver, I think is what it comes down to. Hey, pilot, does your pilot uniform make a short flight feel like a transcon slog? Flight uniforms have reinvented aviation shirts with 3D stretch, stain repellents, and no wrinkles. These shirts are just plain comfortable and ready for takeoff right out of your rollerboard. Flight Uniform is trusted by more than 25,000 pilots and their flagship flight shirt has over 1,500 five-star reviews. I've worn every pilot shirt out there and if you know me, you know I only wear flight uniforms. Be the envy of every cockpit at flightuniform.com and get a special podcast exclusive discount with the code SPITFIREPOD20 to take 20% off your first order. That's SPITFIREPOD20, all one word, for 20% off your first order at FlightUniform.com. Absolutely. Yeah. I think it was great to attend those webinars that are offered. And it's ultimately just gets back into that utilize the available resources that are out there. Because overall, as I say, this equation of how to be an overcomer, resiliency, making connections, practicing, and using the available resources, nobody's going to give you this opportunity. Of course, like the headlines are pilot shortage. You know, you're going to get hired right off the bat and so forth. Well, I mean, you're looking at a person, in in my case, who's got over 1,850 hours flying the KC-135, you know, man flying in general, over 2,100 hours total. I even have, like I say, the the 2,000 unmanned hours. And I thought, oh, slam dunk, right? No. It happened in my case where it was the hearing a no, not once, a no a second time, but not giving up and just identifying the knowing my why and moving forward to understand that this is where I need to be at. And I use that as a drive and follow through to accomplish based off of that feedback that I received off of those no's to then invite for a re-interview. And my view really kind of like moving forward. And ultimately, that's my motto is to keep on aiming high. And it's a mindset, Nick. For me, it's always like a what's next thinking big picture, whether it's a good or a bad thing, because life happens, right? What's next? Just keep on aiming high. Yeah. So do you think that the difference between your first interview and your second interview was the prep that you did? Or was it something else? Yeah, I think, you know, having kind of like getting professional help from a psychiatrist necessarily, but the resources that are out there, the professional help in my case certainly helped, worked best to focus uh, my answers. In my case, it was to listen to that question and be able to deliver it out in a uh, digestible format that would be under two minutes. Yet again, every answer didn't have to have a story with it. But the ones that, especially when it comes to, hey, tell me about a checkride fail, tell me about this situation, all those behavioral questions that come about, you have a purpose for each one you're answering. And I really enjoyed listening yet again from my interview. I listened to a lot of your podcasts of highlighting it's not just all 
aviation related stories of what they're looking for. I kind of have a proud heritage too, from the standpoint of an entrepreneurial spirit. My family, we actually owned a family business, kind of a little similar to your RV park situation. For me, when we were down at an assignment in New Mexico, we actually ran a family business that ran an outdoor movie business, a movie screen rental business, where if you've ever been to a movies in the park type of situation, we were a business that kind of ran it. Funflix was the name. We're all about big screens, big sounds big fun. So shout out to my friends with Fun Flicks. You do an awesome job. And it was a great part because we loved putting smiles on kids, especially those kids, but overall making family memories and a really cool thing. So I was able to, to be honest with you, Nick, I was listening from you in that mentorship, even through this podcast, you have a really strong outreach because I took that and I was like, okay, I can incorporate non-aviation stories in this pilot interview. And I actually said that in the re-interview, talking about that for the customer service. I think that was a big help. I hope you gave them a plug for the podcast. I've actually reached out to them and they haven't gotten back to me. So... <laughs> Oh my gosh. Okay. We'll have to have another talk with them. That's all right. Okay. So you've got this pathway program. How long do you expect to stay in this pathway program? And because the idea is to get to the major, right? Correct. In my case, kind of going back to PPOT, my mentor with PPOT gave me one of the best bits of advice, which was to get to your dream airline in the fastest time frame. Okay. You're going into a community that is seniority based. So yet again, with my scenario, this pilot pathway program for the major airline that was my dream airline basically gave this opportunity through SkillBridge, which is a program about 180 days out from a service members' retirement or separation where they have to apply and they have to get approved by their commander and get matched with a company to learn a skill. All right. In my case, this major airline has paired up with a flight training center in the country where yet again, about that 180 day mark out, I'm able to kind of do my transition from the military while still getting paid to do the internship. And it's basically an internship is what we're talking about. So the pathway itself for me, because they actually have different arms of uh, how you can become and get to that major airline in the end. In my case, I'm one that needs to overcome the recency. I'm one that needs to get an ATP. So they actually have a pathway for that. So in my case, my plan is at that 180-day mark to go ahead and take care of the ATP CTP first, move on to that flight training center where I'm going to be able to get checked out in a multi-engine aircraft, a Piper Seminole. I'm hoping over the several months that I'm there to actually earn and apply my certified flight instruction for multi-engine out there build up my experience. And then that second half, if you will, my time out at the flight training center, I will aim to get that ATP done. So then when I'm complete with my time frame with the skill bridge, I'm just waiting for that major airlines first officer class to match up. So then I can just transition right back over there. And as if in my view, kind of what Josh Lee said when you interviewed him with our tag, one of the goals would be is somebody that is kind of like maneuvering and doing that transition where there's no break in service, there's no gap. And I'm angling myself so that and preparing myself so that I can do that. Yeah, the skill bridge opportunities for pilots are really awesome for the military aviator and or the military person, whether you're officer or enlisted, no matter what it's available for you. At Spitfire, we are a SkillBridge authorized provider. So we have interns that do awesome jobs. So if you need an internship and you don't need to fly, give us a shout. I'll hook you up. I think the important fact is the fact that you are going to be able to make that transition. One of the things you're going to have to do is the ATP written. And if you have not done that yet, pro tip, shout out to Shepard Air Test Prep. I mean, that's the number one place to go because you just... It's the memorization game. So you can go take that test. That's so obnoxiously long. Have you started on that? Yeah. Another great question. I'm still several months from my skill bridge start. Thankfully, with this kind of applying the being overcomer formula I've talked to you about here today, I've had that opportunity to actually kind of time everything out where I have yet again, just about a little under five months to go till my skill bridge timeframe starts. Um, so what I want to do is continue flying at the flying club. All right. Not give up that skill set that I've been working back to building. I've got my rehacking of currencies. I've, I've got both daytime and nighttime. I'm working right now with the CFI that has been awesome for me on flying a DA40 uh, to do the 
content speed prop operations. When you talk about and to answer that question about ATP prep, I, I did ask uh, my uh, you know representative that I'm going to be connected with for Skillbridge over at the Flying Training Center. Hey, can I start you know can you start scheduling me for the ATP CTP? And oh by the way, can I start going through and doing the study prep? Both answers so far are yes. So it goes back to what I was saying before, Nick. Nobody's going to just hand you these things. You got to drive, or in this case, what we do, we fly. You have the aircraft. You're in control. So with that being said, it's what you do with it is what matters. Absolutely. And I'll tell you, you are probably going to have a similar experience to mine where the ATP test is just one of those hazing things that you have to do. And then you have to go to a week-long CTP which is the, I don't even remember what it stands for, but it essentially is a class where you learn about crew resource management working in a multi-crew platform, and then you spend some time in a simulator. And it's a total scam and a total waste of time, but there are some companies that make big bucks out of them. And I should probably start my own company because it is not cheap to do. But it's a it's one of those, got to do it. And it's, I mean, it's like five grand or something like that. And so just roll with it and enjoy it while you're doing it. Absolutely. I kind of feel like, uh, you know, even going through the, the pathway program that I, I went with, uh, you know, I had to take a pilot assessment test and uh, you kind of worked on through it. it really, uh, you know, kind of invested in some other, invest in yourself, if you will, right? So I had to go through some pilot assessment test prep as well. I remember going through that for about a month. It did help because you get your assessments as far as when was the last time you learned all the quadratic equation stuff, science questions and all these sort of things. Oh, it's all cool. For me, we homeschool our our daughters. And one of the cool things is I'm I'm a teacher for one of them with science and the other with uh, history and geography. So on that science one, I've been learning a lot over these years with her. And I kind of definitely applied it in that front. Big picture, though, it's uh, yet again, it's what you make out of it is the key thing. And enjoy the ride, right? There's the highs and lows. But ultimately, if this is what you want, is if this is your dream of what you want it to be, if it was easy, then everybody would do it, right? That's true. And I'm the guy that would fail that pilot assessment. I oh, Man, I'm so... <laughs> There is one fun thing where it's like a simulator where you basically have to kind of like you're controlling the plane and you're flying over things and you're hearing radio calls and you have to increase your altitude and decrease your altitude. And then you'll get questions at the end of like, how many like cows did you pass over and all these other things that you got to answer right. So that's yeah, pretty fun, huh? Oh my gosh. That gives me so much anxiety. <laughs> I'm so glad that I've got a job. <laughs> Jimmy, I really appreciate you coming on the show and just talking about your experience in the drone community, right? In the unmanned system community. There are so many people that are trying to thread this needle and figure out how to do it. And they want it faster and funnier. And I think that you take a really pragmatic approach. And I just really appreciate you coming in and spending a few minutes with me and with the pilot that's listening. Because really what you're doing is you're not just chatting me, but this is an enduring piece of information that is going to be there for people for a long time. And as long as it's relevant, it's going to be there. And I'm super thankful for each person that comes and finds this and gets inspired by your path. So thank you for coming out and thank you for spending time and pouring into the pilot. I really appreciate you, my man. Hey, it's been a pleasure and yet again, an honor. I got to say awesome stuff to be here with you, Nick. And I agree too. One of my goals of today was just to be that inspiration for future aviators. Thank you. This is important. Before you go, you need to know that 2024 is going to be unbelievably competitive in the world of pilot hiring, and you need to make sure that you separate yourself from the herd. The only way that you can guarantee that you'll land your dream job is by partnering with Spitfire Elite Interview Consulting. We are the only choice for application review and interview prep. We are the partners that you've been looking for from start to finish and it's never too early to be part of our community. Just go over to my website, spitfireelite.com, and use the coupon code R4P to save yourself 10% on all of our services. Again, that's the letter R, the number four, and the letter P to save 10%. So go out there and slay your interviews.